Hi, I'm Yassine Alihimoud, and I will be telling you about insights into searches for anisotropies in the stochastic gravitational background using a Fisher formalism. This is based on two papers with uh, Tristan Smith and Karim Gurley. One of them is already on the archive, and the second paper is to appear this week. You should watch Tristan's talk first, as he's going to be discussing uh, the first paper mostly. And I will be discussing the second paper mostly. So first, briefly, why uh, anisotropies from a cosmologist's perspective? So cosmology arguably entered the modern era in 1965 when Penzias and Wilson measured one number about the cosmic microwave background, which is its overall temperature, assuming a perfect black body spectrum. 25 years later, Kobe did measure the frequency spectrum of the CMB to very high precision and showed indeed that it was a perfect black body spectrum. Also, Kobe measured the large scale full sky temperature and isotropies of the CMB. Following Kobe, WMAP and then Planck have measured the CMB with increasing sensitivity and angular resolution, uh, not only the temperature, but also its polarization. And from this, we have been able to understand in great detail the uh, energy content of the universe and its in initial conditions. So PTAs are basically in the pre pendius wilson era. We still haven't measured even one, still haven't detected even one single number about the stochastic uh, nanohertz, stochastic gravitational wave background. But it's never too early to start thinking about the next steps. So the next steps are, first of all, we want to think about what can we learn in terms of the physics uh, and the focus of this talk and of this work is how to best go about to search for these properties beyond the uh, overall amplitude of the stochastic gravitational wave background. So what is a Fisher formalism and why do we want to do this? So essentially a Fisher formalism is the theorist's reduction of the data analysis process. Why do we care about this? As you all know, to be able to claim a detection of the gravitational wave background, we need to use pulsar cross correlations. With nanograph, there are already 45 pulsars being used, corresponding to 990 pairs. The SKA promises to hunt down hundreds of new low noise millisecond pulsars, out of which we will be able to construct PTAs with tens of thousands of pairs. You can see that this is quickly going to become uh, computationally unmanageable. And so we need some simple and robust tools to be able to make some forecasts about what these instruments can or cannot see without necessarily running uh, time consuming Monte Carlo simulations. And we also need some simple tools to be able to guide and optimize full blown data analysis. And that's the point of this Fisher formalism. As a very simple example application, so in this talk and in the paper, we're using the full EPTA data set which constitutes, uh, which comprises 42 pulsars out of which one can make 861 pairs. So here we have ranked the pairs according to their contribution to the monopole signal to noise ratio squared. And we show that out of the 44 best pairs, which, which is 5% of the total number of pairs, one can recover 90% of the SNR squared, which is 95% of the SNR. I want to really emphasize the point that we have to shift away from individual pulsars, but rather think about pulsar pairs when it comes to the stochastic gravitational wave background. Another example to whet your appetite is that we were able to understand and reproduce the anisotropy results uh, of Taylor et al using six of the EPTA pulsars. And so this is our equivalent of this map, which is obtained with much less computational time. The overall amplitude is slightly off, but you can see that the qualitative and quantitative similarities are quite striking. Importantly, and unfortunately, I will explain to you that these cannot be interpreted as upper limits on the gravitational wave background in each pixel. So let's construct this Fisher formalism. And again, this is the theorist reduction of the data analysis process. So the first step in the data analysis is to measure the timing residuals of each pulsar. So these are measured with some noise. Out of those, we can estimate the cross power spectra of timing residuals between pulsars P and Q. Again, those are estimated from the data, but with some noise. So they have some variance. This variance, we quantify it by this characteristic strain squared. 
those are basically dimensionless numbers. So you have to multiply by some frequency and time of observation. Uh, so those characterize the intrinsic noise of each pulsar. And they also account for the loss of information due to the fitting of a uh, deterministic timing model uh, through the transmission function. So those are computed uh, with the code Hasasiya given some pre-analysis of uh, the uh, intrinsic noise of the pulsars. The second thing we need is the geometric properties of uh, the PTA, which is another way to put it is how does the PTA respond to a, uh, an angular dependent gravitational wave background? So I'm going to call this for short the intensity of the gravitational wave background. So the, this is basically the characteristic strain squared times some angle dependent function, which integrates to unity. The uh, timing residual cross power spectra are linearly related to this intensity through some integral over the sky. So these are the sky directions of the intensity times some function gamma PQ, which depends on the pulsar pair and depends on the direction omega. Any function of omega, which is the gravitational wave direction on the sky, I will call it a map for short. And these average over the sky directions of the product of two maps defines a scalar product on the space of maps for short. Now you actually already know what this function is. It's the sum of the so-called antenna beam pattern squared, but we show in the first paper that this actually has a very simple explicit expression that is completely frame independent. It doesn't require, the, require any H plus H cross. It's this simple expression in terms of dot products of uh, unit norm vectors. We call this the pairwise timing response function. In terms of things that you're probably familiar with, the so-called overlap reduction function is basically the ter this pairwise timing response function dotted into the angular dependence of the gravitational wave background. So now we can construct the Fisher matrix. Just like what is done in current data analysis, we're going to specialize to a factorizable uh, gravitational wave background as a function which depends on angle only, which has dimensions of characteristic strain squared and some power law of frequency. Now, if the timing residual cross power spectra, to simplify, we're going to assume that they're Gaussian distributed. And as a consequence, because they are linearly related to this amplitude A, this also will be Gaussian distributed given some data. So this is just some Gaussian distribution. This dot product, again, is a double integral over directions in the sky. This A hat here is an optimal estimator built from the data. This generalizes the optimal statistics for an anisotropic gravitational wave background. So what goes in this Fisher matrix? This is a sum over all pulsar pairs of some coefficient times these pairwise timing response functions at direction omega and omega prime. These coefficients are an inverse variance weighting of the assumed frequency dependence squared of the uh, gravitational wave background. So basically, this contains the noise properties of the pulsars, and these contain the geometric properties of the pulsar timing array. So this Fisher matrix is a very compact summary of the noise and geometric properties of the PTA. You can think of it as the inverse covariance matrix of the gravitational wave background in pixel space. Now, let me make a rather obvious, but very important point nonetheless. Given n pair cross correlations between different pulsar pairs, one can at most constrain n pair independent pieces of information. So if I were to draw an infinite dimensional space in which these gravitational wave background maps live, this A, there is an n pair dimensional space, which is spanned by these timing response functions. And one can measure in principle, the component of A on this space. But this A gravitational wave background also has a component on the infinite dimensional space of maps which are completely unobservable because they are orthogonal to all of these timing response functions. So again, this is a piece which is fundamentally unobservable by a pulsar timing array. So you can think of this estimator as really the estimator of the observable part only. And you have no hope to ever measure this with the pulsar timing array. So how do we use the Fisher matrix to 
uh, estimate the sensitivity of the gravitational background components if we have some given map basis. So suppose we have some good physical reasons to search for the gravitational background as a sum of some known maps times some amplitude. For example, this could be the spherical harmonics. So the goal of the game here is to estimate how sensitive the PTA is to these components A n. Again, for the problem to be well-defined, you can only afford to have at most n pair different maps. So given these, this problem, the covariance of these coefficients, you can show that they are the inverse of the matrix, which is obtained by dotting these basis maps on both sides with the Fisher matrix. And to convince yourself, you can take one single basis map, which is a monopole, and you will find that the covariance of the monopole uh, is the usual, uh, well, the variance of the monopole is the usual variance of the optimal statistics. So given this covariance matrix, we can obtain the sensitivity, the 95% sensitivity to these coefficients, which is just twice the square root of the variance of these coefficients. And this is how we construct, for example, the sensitivity to the of the EPTA uh, to the gravitational wave background amplitude in a set of coarse pixels. In this case, 12 coarse pixels and here 192 coarse pixels. So those are the sensitivity after marginalization over all the other pixels. And you can see that as you go from 12 to 192 pixels, the sensitivity dramatically degrades uh, in each pixel. You can also ask what is the sensitivity to the monopole, which is the average gravitational wave background amplitude. It is not obtained by simply taking the average of these maps. You can find that for one single pixel, we, our estimates of the 95% sensitivity of the EPTA to AH is 2.5 times 10 minus 15. For 12 pixels, this degrades by a factor of two, and it degrades by another factor of 1.5, roughly for 192 pixels. We also did this um, uh, exercise with spherical harmonics, but before, let me tell you about this map. So this is a map which has been obtained with six EPTA pulsars, which make 15 pairs, and is uh, attempting to find the upper limit on 12,288 pixels. And so clearly this is cannot be because you have way too many pixels compared to the number of independent data points. So what is this map exactly showing? Going back to our infinite dimensional space of maps, we have the maps here. We have this observable component, which has n pair dimensions, and we have this unobservable component. So this map you can show, because this is really obtained by using the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Um, you can show that it's precisely an upper limit on only the observable component. As a consequence, it cannot be interpreted as an upper limit on the full gravitational wave background because this unobservable component can be arbitrarily large. And the dimensionality of this space is infinite. To really drive the point home, so we could build again a forecast for this map and get you know, the same uh, features and even overall amplitude as the Taylor et al map. We did the same exercise with only two pulsars, which presumably is less data, but we find these map to be to have a much lower amplitude, which is inconsistent, which you know less data should give you worse upper limits. The reason is that with only one pair, the space of observable maps is smaller. And again, you're only setting a constraint on this space of observable maps, not on the true underlying gravitational wave background. So these are not upper limit maps. So again, we did the same exercise with spherical harmonic amplitude. You can read the paper to uh, see the details. And we also compare with the uh, six EPTA pulsars, and we find agreement, and we're able to reproduce the results for Lmax greater than two, which is under constraint. Lastly, we ask what are the n pair statistically independent pieces of information that the PTA can measure in map space? Those are simply the eigenmaps of the Fisher matrix, which I'm showing the nine first eigenmaps here. What is interesting is that with these eigenmaps, one can try to reconstruct the observable piece of the gravitational wave background. So suppose that we have this as an input map. If its overall amplitude is 10 to minus 14 in characteristic strain, we would be able to measure, to detect the amplitudes of three principal maps. And this would be the reconstructed map. 
as we crank up this amplitude by a factor of square root of three and another factor of square root of three, we would measure the, we would detect the amplitudes of 13 and then 26 principal maps. And this would be the reconstructed version of this map. This for reference would correspond to a signal to noise ratio for the monopole of 300. So even with a huge uh, amplitude, it would be difficult to actually reconstruct uh, the angular dependence of the map. I'm running out of time, so I will let you read my conclusions and feel free to talk to me at the conference.